what's the difference between Tesla or Ford? All their cars have four wheels. They've got a steering wheel. They're propulsed through the world. They have turn signals. The difference is not so much like what is the chemical makeup of the metal they use or something like that. It's actually the methodology by how they arrive at their product. Welcome to Founded and Funded. I'm Majuna Managing Director Karan Mahandru, here today with Scott Stevenson, co-founder and CEO of DeepGram, a foundational AI company building a voice AI platform providing APIs for speech-to-text and text-to-speech. From medical transcription to autonomous agents, DeepGram is the go-to for developers of voice AI experiences, and they're already working with over 500 companies, including NASA, Spotify, and Twilio. Today, Scott and I dive into the realities of building a foundational AI company, meaning they're building models and modalities from scratch. We discuss the challenges of moving from prototype to production, how startups need to outfox the hyperscalers while also partnering with them, and of course, how he went from being a particle physicist working on detecting dark matter to building large language models for speech recognition. This is a must listen for anyone building in AI. So with that, here's Scott. To kick us off today, Scott, why don't you share a little bit about your incredible background as a particle physicist turned voice recognition startup CEO, not your traditional journey into AI. I built deep underground dark matter detectors and we were working about two miles underground. And so imagine a James Bond layer. You know, there's yellow railings, there's cranes, there's all sorts of, you know, workers like milling about in the background <laughs> with hard hats on and building stuff. And that's exactly what was happening. And we were doing this for a few years, building the the quietest place in the universe um, from a radioactivity perspective. And the purpose of this experiment was to detect dark matter with a terrestrial based detector. And you had to build these super sensitive detectors that analyzed waveforms, these analog waveforms, hundreds of them in real time. And you tried to pick out the signal from the noise. Um, so we had this experience building with FPGAs and training models with GPUs and doing signal processing and using neural networks in order to understand what's inside waveforms. And when we were down there, we also noticed that what we were doing was like pretty insane, I think. You know, who gets to do this? Who gets to work two miles underground and work on all this stuff? And so we thought, man, there should be some documentary crew or there should be like somebody down here. There, there wasn't, you know, but we're like, well, we could be our own crew. Let's build a little device to record audio all day, every day to make a backup copy of what we're doing. And then we started to realize, like, wait a minute, you could put these two things together. The types of models that we were building to analyze waveforms could be used for audio as well. And then the thousands of hours that we recorded then, or, you know, many hundreds of hours, you would be able to search through and find the interesting moments inside. And then all the dull moments you would just get rid of. And we, we looked at for a uh, for an API or for a service that would like provide that to us. And this is back in 2015 and they just didn't exist. And once we looked around long enough, we said, hey, we should just be the ones to build this. And so nine years ago, we started DeepGram. That's an amazing story. Every time I hear it, it is fascinating. Just given what you were doing, it is also a reminder for me that some of the best founders and companies are born out of frustration and extreme pain that they've faced themselves. So. That's awesome. So tell me, so at that point, you start at DeepGram. Maybe just talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, going in theses you had. It feels like you were pretty intentional about building a developer first and a developer centric approach to solving this problem. So maybe just walk us and the listeners through your thinking when you, when you initially started DeepGram. Yeah, this definitely files under build what you know or like you are your own customer type way of thinking. We were developers. We were looking for an API so that we could analyze our audio. And we realized that there wasn't a good way to do that. So let's build that for ourselves. And then we'll be able to, as long as we're scratching our own itch, we'll at least know one customer that would be interested in it. <laughs> but then we also suspect that there are a lot more out there. And that was an interesting journey because when we first started, we thought, hey, we'll just speak only solely to the individual developer and that will be able to build a product with a lot of users and a, and a big company. But that was nine years ago and we quickly realized that, hang on a second, there's a whole lot of education that has to go on around AI first for, for folks to sort of build up enough demand to support a venture-backed company you know, in that area. But when you look around, there were plenty of other buyers that were 
uh, already there and had tons of pain. And this was in the call center space. So recorded phone calls all across the world. Uh, anytime you hear that this call may be monitored or may be recorded uh, for analysis later, that type of market was already big. And so we focused on B2B first as a company. But we were always this developer mindset. And we just believed that in the coming years, you know, just read the winds and the tide and everything that these things are going to combine. So the developer is going to get more and more power in the organization and figuring out which product they're going to build. And so if you build with B2B in mind, but then you also build with that individual developer in mind, and then you meld them together, then you that's what's going to create the, the really great product, along with building the foundational models that supply that. So really, you know, we had some uh, just initial thoughts around that. And I still believe in them today. And they kind of just turned out to be true. Uh, another one was uh, around end to end deep learning being the thing that will solve the underlying model problem. So that go-to-market and product packaging, along with the foundational deep learning models solving the underlying deep tech problem, and you sort of meld all of those together, and then you just like put the blinders on and only chase after that, and that's what we focused on. Now, having worked with you now for a couple of years, I know there's a lot of tech and a lot of foundational tech that you and the team have built, and it was probably not always up and to the right from the first day that you started building DeepGram. So maybe as you go back and sort of think about the early years, you already mentioned one of the challenges you faced, which is how do you convince customers to buy their foundational tech from a venture-backed and, and very early stage venture company. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other challenges that you probably faced as you were closing your first 20, 30, 50 customers? That decision to press pause on the PLG side and going directly to individuals and then focus only on basically a sales gated, you know, contact us, you know, form but to go after the market that way was a really big one for us. And we learned that through basically getting punched in the face over and over. <laughs> um, uh, and so that's one, but I already talked about that. But there's another, which is the first product that we offered as a company was not speech to text, which is what a lot of people know DeepGram for today our real-time speech to text and our batch mode speech to text in over like 30 different languages. What we started out, our first, first product was a search product, a lot like what we were doing in physics, where you're trying to find individual events that mattered to you. What you would do is try to find individual words or phrases or ideas that were happening in the audio and then surface those. But that education part was, we learned very early on that that was too big of a gap for buyers. How I would think about that today is the product that we built then is essentially a, a vector embedding model uh, plus a fuzzy search. So everybody knows these today with you know great, great companies that do that kind of thing. But we had to make a decision like, well, are we going to be the like fuzzy database vector embeddings company in 2016? Like there's going to be no demand for it for so long. What do people have demand for? Well, they have demand for speech to text. And so and actually, early engineers and researchers at DeepGram, this is one thing that they were kind of hesitant on, you know, hey, isn't speech to text like kind of boring? Because they they know about the fancy stuff that is coming. They know about the embeddings. They know about the speech to speech models. They know about all this other stuff. And it's like, yeah, but we have to earn our license to learn in this market. Basically, we need to establish ourselves in one product domain and we're just undeniable in that domain. And then we can expand into these other domains and it gives us the right to play. And I like to think about that every year, every two years with DeepGram, you know, hey, have we earned the right to play again? Do Have we positioned ourselves really well? But I think that early decision to say, hey, the search side, by the way, we still have that in our product today. Um, but, you know, the, like to, to switch to speech to text to say, hey, this straight to developer PLG switch to B2B as the first move. By the way, we, we do a PLG and, you know, all of that now. And like search and that kind of thing is even better today, et cetera. We get to do all of these things now. But, you know, we, we had to really put the blinders on early. And I think that's an important um, lesson for kind of any kind of company. Pick one thing be really, really good at that thing and then see how you can expand it over time. And you might think, hey, I might expand it over quarters or something like that, but it's generally actually years. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I love that. And and I think we often get into conversations around the trade-offs between focus and having an expansive vision. But I think it's, it's great that you sort of emerged from your position of strength around speech to text and then kind of expanded from there. Um, let's go back to the time when you know, I remember from our conversations, conventional thinking back then was, like you said, 
a lot of these hyperscalers were coming in. Google would launch a speech to text product. And there was this fear of commoditization of the most important source of data with, inside the enterprise, which is voice. And here's this startup called DeepGram that's venture funded with a few customers that has the best product in the market. And I'm sure you faced a lot of people sort of talking about the commoditization of speech to text. Help us understand how you kind of went around that, how you went through that. What was your approach to working with the hyperscalers like AWS and Google? And then I want to get to another moment in the company's history, which I think was really interesting post that. But let's talk a little bit about that first. This is always an interesting line to walk. You, you do want to create a general model that is good in many circumstances and uh, others out there will be creating that as well. There's other technology out there and it, it you know, by some measure, this is a uh, moving toward commoditization. So, so in other words, like interchangeable uh, services, like, hey, we build an API service that supports batch mode in real time. Well, there are others out there that support batch mode in real time, and they support English, and they support Spanish, and, you know, all sorts of things, right? But there are, there, there are differences between them. There's accuracy differences. There's latency differences, uh, the time it takes for the API to respond. There's throughput differences. There's also differences in where you actually run your computation. So you could do it fully in the cloud hosted by us. You can do it in the cloud hosted by you in your own VPC, or you can do it air-gapped uh, in your four walls as well. And so these different areas of competition and differentiation start to show up. So there is a little bit of commoditization where you want folks to get together and and learn essentially to build like their first demo to to scale up a little bit. But then they start to feel the pain in the other areas. They start to feel it in latency. They start to feel it in accuracy. They start to feel it in the ad adaptability of the model or uh, where it runs. And so from our perspective, we were thinking, hey, we think from first principles that these systems can be way cheaper than they were before. Uh, you know, a few years ago, the only way to get speech to text was to pay $2 an hour. And I just think that's 10 times too much. But if you drop the price 10x, then you can get 100x or, you know, 1000x more usage. And so this is one one angle for us. So you always have to kind of walk the line. You, you, you have like a kind of a commodity offering, but then you have this differentiation that makes it plainly not a commodity for a B2B customer that needs you know, the best accuracy or the best latency or the best, you know, cogs or whatever it is, then you actually have these uh, large areas of differentiation. One of the things that I remember in our conversations early on, the, the conventional thinking at that time, if you want to call it that, was the four things that you mentioned, speed, cost, latency, and accuracy. In some ways, many of them were mutually exclusive. Like if you had speed, you didn't have cost. If you had cost, you didn't have accuracy. And and I think one of the things that DeepCram really pioneered was like remind folks that, no, it is possible to have very accurate, low word error rate products that are low latency power, real time applications. And you can do it at a price where you can still afford yourself 85 percent gross margins. And I know it takes a lot of stuff in the back end, a lot of engineering work that you and the team did. But I think that was that was really interesting. So let's go fast forward now. We got OpenAI, who is in some ways <laughs> a hyperscaler. In some ways, it's like a very nimble startup, and it might be the best of both. And they launch Whisper as their speech-to-text product. So let's walk through that sort of moment in time. What did that do to DeepCram? How did, how did you react to when that came out? What did you hear in the market? What did you then tell, remind yourself and the team to do? I remember when that came out and we did our first testing, we we're like, ooh, this model is pretty good. And also their mentality on how to structure the model was like, ooh, this is this is an end to end deep learning model for real. And up until that point in time, every open source speech to text model was not. It put together several different pieces. So it was missing. Uh, it was missing mostly on accuracy, um, but it also was missing in speed and latency and all that. But if you don't have accuracy, then the other stuff doesn't matter. But we're like, hey, this model is actually pretty good uh, out of the box. And it supports several languages as well. But one, one thing, though, to take a step back and look at as us as a company is um, who did the first end to end speech to text models in the world? You know, it was DeepGram and we did them like seven years prior to Whisper being released. Right. And so we we're kind of like, hey, like, I, I'm surprised it took this long for somebody to put all this together and put a model out there. I'm also like, 
glad that OpenAI, who has a very big marketing bullhorn, you know, they can when they say something, the the world listens. Now everybody is aware that end-to-end deep learning works for speech. And not only that, some of these other things that previously were thought impossible, like supporting multiple languages in a model and that kind of thing, were just people didn't think about that. And uh, so I'm glad that they did this education as well into a into a reasonable level on the accuracy side as well. And so it helped everybody get pushed through their learning cl- curve faster for folks who wanted to implement AI, in, like voice AI into their products. But I, I think from the outside, you might think like, oh, no, OpenAI just open sourced this model. Like what what's going to happen? Right. But like we talked about before on the other differentiation, like latency, high throughput, low cogs, uh, running hybrid in the cloud or on your own uh, infrastructure, all of those things matter, but also our own models are also more accurate than Whisper too. And there's a reason for that because Whisper and models like it and many open source models are trained on public data. When our customers work with us, they can adapt models to their own domain. So in that domain, you can expose your models to different acoustic environments or audioscapes. And then the model can get really good at those types of things. If you feed that type of audio to an open source model that's only trained on YouTube videos, it typically doesn't do as well. And so from the outside, it might look like, oh, no. But for us, we're like, oh, yes, like, great. Everybody's going to get educated around this. When they try out the open source stuff, try to run it themselves, all of that, they'll be like, wow, this is really complicated. This is expensive. It's hard to make the model do what I want it to do. But now they'll be educated and say, hey, are there other products out there in the world? And yes, there are, you know, DeepGram, where you can build a a B2B voice AI product and have it just work, you know, so... We definitely had to take a beat as a company and say, like, hey, what's our positioning going to be around this? Because the world is going to wonder, you know, like, what do we think about it? Um, But we told, you know, I I wrote a blog post at the time and I probably did like a podcast or something Mm -hmm. about it, too, (laughs) saying, like, we're glad about this because, hey, it's moving all of it forward. And now everybody will be educated about uh, the power of intent, uh, deep learning for speech. Now, I, I remember those conversations at the board level as well, where in there was a there was a little bit of a pause. There was a breather. And then we realized that OpenAI just did DeepGram and this entire speech AI market a huge favor yep. by educating and having that, like you said, the, the megaphone that they had. So that's great. All right. So if you think about, you know, in venture, we always say the, the, the trick is to be non-consensus and right. And there's a lot of people that are operating on consensual thinking. And so if you think about what the world believes about AI or more specifically speech AI today that you don't believe to be true or conversely, what do we not believe to be true that you think it is? Mm-hmm. It'd, be, it'd be helpful to hear a little bit of your vision into where this goes and what most of us are probably getting wrong in our assumptions about AI or speech AI. Yeah, I'm smiling because six months ago, the answer would be different than a year ago, than two years ago, et cetera, <laughs> because it's been such a rapid pace of learning and just everybody paying their tuition around like what AI is capable of and how fast it can do different things. I like to think about this, like there were tech companies and other intelligence companies and intelligence companies move like three times faster. And yeah, so I have to update my own model of like, Where's the world at and what does the world understand, you know, compared to our own? And also, are there overreactions? Um, So, for instance, uh, a year ago, it was really plain to see that smaller models, more efficient models are going to become super important because the cost of the inference is going to matter so much. And a, a big reason for that is AI is actually effective. And so when you scale it up, no company wants to pay a $100 million AI bill. And so over the last year, we've seen that that come true. You know, COGS have become more important. You know, costs has dropped for LLMs and that kind of thing. But uh, we've we've seen a recent thing now, which is uh, maybe a couple months ago, two months ago, OpenAI did their demo of GPT-40 with with the voice mode. It's a speech to speech model. And I think the industry probably absorbed that a little too much. And they think, Okay, everything has to be a multimodal model. I'll caution folks against that. Multimodal models are great, especially in a consumer use case, because, you know, kind of jack of all trades situation, you allow them and shape them into a single personality and then allow them to handle some of the the normal tasks. And that will work fairly well. But in a B2B use case, 
where you're trying to build a voice AI agent that handles insurance claims, or you're trying to, like, there are so many different things, a different food ordering, et cetera. They're going to have to interact with CRMs. They're going to have to, in, these these voice AI agents, just like humans, just think of it as a human, okay? They're, they're going to have to interact with a CRM. They're going to have to interact with a knowledge base. They're going to have to interact with all, with all these things. Just a speech-to-speech model that is trained to just sound likable and respond to things is not going to be able to do that. You're going to have to have separate parts that have uh, different beefed up components and every B2B company is going to have to choose where they want to spend their cogs, basically. So do you need really good speech to text? Do you need really good LLMs? Do you need really good text to speech? Do you need them to interact with a RAG system? Do you need them to interact with whatever next gen, you know, cognitive architecture system that is coming out? And because of that, you're going to need controllability. So the idea that multimodal models will like save us all and like just reduce all of the complexity, I don't think that's necessarily true because these models need to interact with all these other pieces. And it's going to take a while. It's going to take several years for that to shake out. Don't get me wrong, though. Three years from now, five years from now, you'll start to see a condensation of the different areas, you know, into more multimodal. It, it probably won't be all one single master huge model, you know, but it will be uh, components of it that you put together. It won't look so much like a Swiss Army knife. It'll look more like putting together AWS Lego blocks or something like that in the future. But at least for B2B right now, you need more control. You don't want to just leave it open ended to a, a speech to speech system to handle like your your bank account resets and and that kind of thing. You need way more control over it. No, it's all right. I mean, the, the pace at which the space is moving just makes anything that you say almost obsolete by the time you finish saying that. And so I totally resonate to that statement that you have to keep changing your own mental model and your own model by adapting to what's happening. All right, well, let's let's look to the future now. I mean, one of the things I love about this space and speech as a modality or as a as a way of interaction with the world is that it's not zero sum to in many ways. It's sort of like expanding the pie of what's possible once you get to a place where DeepGram gets to and allows people to build these amazing applications. So maybe talk a little bit about some examples of enterprise B2B applications that DeepGram is powering today And then as you look forward, without divulging too much, of course, just what should we expect? What should customers expect? What should the world expect from DeepGram in the near future? Yeah, we're in a revolution right now. And actually, I I kind of wince when people call it like another industrial revolution. I think it's actually different. So we had an agricultural revolution. We had a an industrial revolution, then we had an information revolution. Now we're in an intelligence revolution. And I won't go into the specific details of each of those, but like intelligence is is different. And before, just two years ago or prior, you had to have a human do intelligent work. That is not necessarily true anymore. Just like in the industrial revolution, you had to have a human swing the hammer. And that was that was not true after that anymore. And just like in the information revolution, you had to write down on paper and file away in a filing cabinet and all of this. Not anymore. Not after the information revolution. You can transmit information at the speed of light and you can categorize it and you can search it and you can do all these things. And so in our current situation, things are going to change drastically. But I'm, they're not going to change all at once. And a company like DeepGram is not going to try to tackle all these things at once. OK, so I think it's it's important to recognize that everything is going to be touched by this, just like everything was touched by electricity. Everything was touched by cars and transportation. Everything was touched by the Internet, et cetera. So then that comes back to us putting the blinders on and saying, hey, we have a belief that there are these fundamental infrastructure companies that need to be built that that are also foundational model builders at, at the same time. And this is what what DeepGram is. And so we have a horizontal platform that anybody could use, you know, ostensibly to do anything. But we are we're going to focus in certain areas that are going to make the world more productive, but also that we have an advantage just from what we have already done or from the way we think about the world. And so that advantage from our perspective is scale. So we always think about the world from first principles and what will scale. And so we're thinking about cost per watt. We're thinking about like how much training data do we need in order to do that kind of thing. So we look at the world like, hey, the uh, call centers, food ordering, that kind of thing. This is all massive scale and it's all going to be disruptive, uh, disrupted. And so we're going to focus in that area where there's scale, Um, where there's other areas like doing dialogue for a Hollywood film or something like that. That's not our game. There are other companies uh, that are out there that will will do that well. 
I think it's really helpful to think about the world in these in these ways that there's there's certain things that uh, scale gets you. And if you drop the price, then now you can kind of change the the face of work and how it happens. So we'll do our part in the voice AI area. There will be other companies doing it from a search perspective. There will be other companies doing it in, in text. Uh, at some point in the future, we'll all kind of have to figure out how we all fit together, but that that point is not now. So let's let's just go transform our own uh, respective areas. Scott, yeah. one of the one of the interesting things about some of the applications that I hear about from you and and the team that DeepGram is powering, the distinction between what we hear from a lot of the AI, other other AI companies is a lot of stuff that is happening in prototype stages, a lot of stuff that is happening in sort of toy boxes. And I think one of the stuff, one of the things that is really unique about DeepGram is it is a foundational AI company that is powering real use cases in production for large enterprises. But we don't hear a lot of examples of actual AI companies powering use cases in production. And I think DeepGram is an exception in that. It's kind of amazing to me at this point. I think we could say that by default, you could probably assume that DeepGram is under the hood if the if the speech to text is working well in in whatever product you're using. Don't get me wrong, there are other good technologies out there, but like it's a pretty good bet. And that's just in speech to text. We released our text to speech last year as well. And that is that is growing at a really big clip too. And that's powering that real-time agent uh, side. And so we have we have companies like embedded uh, device companies that many people would be familiar with. I actually, <laughs> unfortunately, I feel like I have to be cagey about this because many of our customers don't like us to say <laughs> that DeepGram is under the hood. Um, but I can, yeah. you know, I can mention some of them. But but nevertheless, there's a lot out there that is being powered right now. If there's one thing to take away from this, uh, it's not like this is coming. It is already here. It's already being utilized. And but now it's being utilized in in new ways that uh, will be even more user facing. And you'll start to think if I call a call center, if I need to order something, if I'm going to talk to something, uh, you know, online, you're not going to dread it. You're not going to think like, oh, great, I'm going to spend 45 minutes and it's going to be a horrible process you'll actually start to be glad. You'll be like, wow, that was, a, that was really peppy. It, it understood exactly what I needed. I solved my problem. You know, I'm in and out in three minutes. You know, that's way better than sending an email and waiting for it to come back three days from now or something. Is, is there something, Scott, about the nature of the product that DeepGram has or the use cases that you power that just makes it, I, I don't want to call it easier because nothing you do as a startup is ever easy, but easier than many of the other AI companies that are having a hard time moving, taking that leap from prototype to actually powering production use cases. Why is it that it's working so well at DeepGram and yet so many AI companies are having a hard time with that? I think partially time is on our side. You know, there's only a handful of foundational AI companies that were started around 2015 and we have the benefit of being one of those. Another is coming from first principles at the problem. So I like to liken this to what's the difference between Tesla or Ford? Or what's the difference between SpaceX and Lockheed Martin? All their cars have four wheels. They've got a steering wheel. They're propulsed through the world. They have turn signals. You know, the rockets are tall and pointy and they have an engine at the other end. You know, what is the difference, right? And the difference is not so much like what is the chemical makeup of the metal they use or something like that. It's actually the methodology by how they arrive at their product. So you have to think of your company as a as a factory, I think, right now. For to build a true like a true foundational AI company, efficiency matters, bring in some of the Amazon mindset and everything as well because it's it's really more like three companies in one. You're you're a cutting edge research company like DeepMind, you know. And you're a you're a cutting edge infra company, you know, trying to compete with AWS and Google and Azure and all of that. But you're also uh, you either need to partner with or be yourself a, an amazing data labeling company as well. And when you get all three of those right, then you can have this this amazing product. So that's the secret. You know, it, yeah. it isn't that much of a secret, but it's just really hard to do all of that takes. from a from a from a lean perspective and from a first principles mindset. But what we're always looking for internally is instead of thinking, should we hire for that? You know, we think, should we do it at all? And then the next thing w would be, can we automate this? You know? Okay, the next would be, well, maybe we need to hire for it now, but can we automate it later? So you're always trying to explore and then condense and explore and condense. And then you rely on like this backbone, like spinal cord of the company or whatever that is like just amazingly well suited to accomplish the goal of, so for instance, like 
the vast majority of models trained in DeepGram now are not trained by a human. They're tra trained by a machine that we built ourselves to do those tasks. Now, the frontier models that have never been trained before, they're partially trained by a machine and partially done by a human. They're working at concert. But that type of thing, you know, if you just tried to start building it today, that would be a very good idea to think along those lines. But, you know, the companies that have been doing it for two years, five years, nine years, in the case of DeepGram, it's hard to go compete with that. So you have to come up with a new first principles thing <laughs> that, that you think, you know, will will be better uh, in the end. And, and, it, and it might take five years for it to pay off just because of the the underlying moats that companies already have. Well, hearing you listening and obviously continuing to talk about where the space goes and how fast this market is evolving and how fast BTI is evolving, I sometimes wonder if you and I were doing this podcast two years from now, whether it'll just be your agent talking to my agent powered by deep gram voice AI. So I, I look and then we'll just approve that. it, you know, in the end we'll be like, yep, yeah, that's what I would that's say. Right. Actually, it's better than how I would say it, you know? Okay, good. Yeah. That's great. Well, on that note, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to you on behalf of all of our listeners. Um, there's so many things I love about Deep Gram. There's, it's such a joy to work with you. It's a privilege to be your partner on this journey. But the one thing I've always said that really separates you from many of the founders that we work with is just the audacity of your ambition and where you want to take Deep Gram and, and by extension, this whole space that you're operating in. So really appreciate you and really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Karan. Love working with you and Madrona.